Okay. Um, welcome everyone uh, to our um, last program in the spring session of Literary Connections, a series. We're happy to have all you participating and we appreciate you spending this um, night with us. Um, in celebration of National Poetry Month, uh, Mark uh, will um, present a lecture discussion on two of T.S. Eliot's greatest poems from his early period, The Love Song of Alfred Prufrock and Geronton. Uh, Mark has been at Yale College since 1990, and he is currently a senior associate dean of the college and, and dean of academic affairs. He is a former lecturer in the English department and received his PhD from Columbia University with concentration in 19th century and early 20th century English literature. He has over 25 years um, uh, lectured on literature and film and has led book discussions in more than 100 venues in Connecticut. So welcome everyone, welcome Mark and take it away. Thank you, Kate, and thank all of you for coming uh, to attend this this evening. Yes, this is the last of the six programs that Kate and I put together that we designed back in the fall of 2020 uh, to look back at 1920 or the 1920s from a literary point of view. Some of the works we did were because the authors were born uh, in the 20s, like James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time, some because a character in the nonfiction work, Henry de Lax, was born in the 1920s, but three of the works, including tonight, were published in the 1920s. We did in November, The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton, a kind of a throwback to more like a 19th century novel. But last month we met to talk about Mrs. Dalloway by, Edith, uh, by um, Virginia Woolf, which is decidedly what's called a modernist work. And I'm gonna talk about modernism briefly. And then tonight, I think for the first time in my long history with Greenwich, we're doing poetry rather than fiction or nonfiction or drama with T.S. Eliot. Uh, April is National Poetry Month, uh, and he is certainly one of the uh, mammoth figures in literary history uh, and poetic output uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So I want to say a couple of things about modernism, uh, but first something about how to read poetry and what we're doing tonight. Um, modernist poetry can be very cryptic, um, can be very demanding, it can put people off. It's partly because there was a radical shift from late 19th century sentimental and beautiful and often very formally organized and rhythmic and rhyming poems to a uh, more, uh, more cacophony, uh, more dislocation, uh, rhyme, but also off rhyme or non rhyme. It's partly because in the 20s, these poets and other authors were trying to process the dislocation that had been ushered in by the uh, First World War, a, a decidedly 20th century war uh, that was um, caused by the breaking of 19th century treaties. If you'd like to read a very good work of literary history, and cultural history that, that talks about how the war affected language and literature, I recommend to you Paul Fussell, F-U-S-S-E-L-L, -L, The Great War and Modern Memory. But when you read poetry, uh, as we will be talking about tonight, it's a mistake to think, in my opinion, that you're trying to translate it into what it means or what it says or what is T.S. Eliot telling us in this line. These are two very great and complicated poems. If we were in a course on T.S. Eliot, we would spend more than a full session on each of them. It's possible to do them justice in what's called close reading, a kind of line by line translation in less than an hour, and I'm not gonna attempt it. But when you read poetry and when we discuss it tonight, the way to think about poetry is it's the presentation or the enactment, not of an idea or a moral or a statement, but of an experience. And it, it does that, it enacts, uh, dramatizes or presents 
argues for an experience in language and sound and form. So stanza form, where the line breaks, what words appear where, those things matter much more in poetry than in prose. And if you think about it conveying an experience rather than an idea that becomes a moral or a statement, uh, you will find yourself a better reader of poetry. Now, the experience can be religious or historical or philosophical or psychological or social. The experience can engender ideas, can be suffused with ideas, but you're not reading the poem to get to the point of a translation. And a lot of people approach poetry that way, and I think it's a mistake. So you'll see the kind of thing uh, that I'll do tonight that might be more uh, understandable when I illustrate it. So here's what I want to say about modernism. Modernism is the label that cultural history, history has given in the West, Europe and America, uh, for the period of artistic output between the two world wars. So works of the 1920s typically fit. And to be an important modernist, you typically have to be born, have been born at the end of the 19th century, the way that Virginia Woolf and James Joyce and T.S. Eliot and Conrad and D.H. Lawrence and many, many other of these great authors, William Carlos Williams, Ernest Hemingway, Faulkner Fitzgerald, on and on. And your output typically is between the two world wars. But it's not just the period of time in which these works appeared. As I said, the Age of Innocence appears in the 1920s. It, it's not really a modernist work the way some of these other authors are. Modernism arises when the artists and intellectuals, uh, the people who have the pulse on uh, kind of the development of civilization, have found that the world has progressed technologically, but out of step with cultural ethos, that we've lost value by being too interested in technology and moving ahead. So the 1920s saw an explosion of cars, radios, uh, telephone, uh, the first uh, uh, commercially licensed radio broadcast was made in 1920. Uh, cars became so prolific in the 1920s, the so-called jazz age, uh, a, a phrase not coined by Fitzgerald, but popularized by him, that the, the expression double parking came into American language, double parked, uh, because there was too many cars and not enough parking lots. Um, cars and radios and telephones, the world became smaller, but it didn't become more understandable. So these artists and cultural critics and intellectuals looked back to ancient times, to the primitive, and I want to make it clear, primitive is not a statement of worth. It just means a society that's not suffused with modern technological embellishments. These authors felt by looking backward to ancient times, we might be able to recoup some of the old ethos, cultural values that can inform this age of isolation and alienation and dislocation. Um, Shakespeare did not think of himself as alienated. John Milton did not think of himself as alienated. It took the Romantic Revolution and especially the late 19th century and early 20th century to talk about alienation, that is feeling strange at home, feeling strange where you shouldn't feel strange. If you go to a foreign country and you feel out of place, that's not alienation. Um, the pandemic making you feel uh, out of step with your own neighborhood, uh, that's alienation. And so the modernists thought, if we look back to the original, um, if like James Joyce, we go back to Homer's epics for our literature, or uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, uh, which premiered in 1913, but became more popular in the 20s, which talked about pagan rituals as a way to reconsider what's happening in modern life. Uh, D.H. Lawrence, Lady Chatterley's Lover, um, that novel argues that uh, a healthy respect for sex and for people who are close to the soil, the lower class, 
uh, be, being more authentic uh, would help resuscitate society. Conrad's Heart of Darkness, T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, uh, which we're not doing, but is um, a masterpiece of his, uh, published in the 1920s that begins with the line, April is the cruelest month. Uh, the Wasteland, like the Rite of Spring, uses ancient pagan rituals of rebirth to suggest that the contemporary world could borrow some notes from ancient societies to try to get back to uh, fundamental values. Uh, and this is part of it. T uh, tonight's uh, section is part of it, uh, this notion that uh, trying to look back to Dante, to Shakespeare, to the classical writers. Now, having said that, the poem as a form, these poems as a form, again, are very cryptic. Um, you may know that Eliot is one of those uh, authors like James Joyce, whose uh, uh, publishing houses have produced lots of guides uh, to the poems of, the novels of, uh, because he's a very broadly read and allusive, that is, giving reference, giving um, language, uh, taking language from other people, but not citing them, uh, not plagiarism, but allusiveness with an A, uh, a reference he would say, as Hamlet said, I did this, but there are loads of um, uh, nods towards uh, ancient writers, uh, and you have to know where they're from, or you have to get the notes, or you can do what I do and say, what does it mean that this poem written in 1917 is loaded with ancient, ancient references that most of us don't get. Ellie would say that's the point, that the contemporary reader of poetry in 1917 has lost his or her co connection to the ancient source, sources of wisdom. So the method often is putting these things together in a kind of pastiche. Those of you who know Joyce's Ulysses know that every chapter is written in a different style. And, and if you've ever read or you plan to reread The Wasteland, it's put together as a kind of combination of fragments. Uh, the writer Donald Bartholomew said famously, collage is the art form of the 20th century. Picasso and others uh, invented the form of collage. Uh, think of some of his Cubist paintings or Guernica, where things seem to have been taken apart and put together again. Or if you know Picasso's famous sculpture, uh, where he took the triangular bicycle seat and the handlebars and welded them together so it looks like the bony head of a steer and the antlers, you say to yourself, oh, I see what he's done. He's taken apart a bicycle and he's put two pieces together that don't belong together. That's what collage is. You rip it apart and you put it together in a different way. And I see a steer's head and a bicycle at the same time. Absolutely brilliant. That's modernism. Picasso also looked back to African art in the same sense of what I'm talking about. Modernism looks to the primitive to say, how can what we've lost tell us what we need to do in this modern society. So how is this relevant to the two poems this evening? Uh, I think of them as pendant poems. Uh, they were published around the same time. That is poems that are best understood as a pairing. They're both monologues. That is a single person is talking. Uh, they may be, uh, one of them, Prufrock, might be a dramatic monologue. That is someone talking to someone else there's an I and there's a you. Uh, I prefer to think that the I and you are both proof rock. And so it's an interior monologue. He's having a kind of argument or debate with himself. Gerontion, Greek for old man, is clearly having uh, an interior monologue. Uh, he's in his own windy head, as we're told. And so from the very beginning, the fact that these two poems have a man in isolation talking to no one but himself is emblematic of what Eliot saw as the modern condition, a, a world without cultural connection, a world without religion. Uh, unlike most of the modernists, T.S. Eliot was uh, 
religious, uh, uh, deeply uh, Anglo-Catholic uh, and uh, a classicist, and as he said, a royalist, uh, very conservative. Most of the modernists are not people whose religion in any formal sense shows up in their work. But both of these men are presented to us in isolation. One of them debating with himself about whether he's going to go to essentially a tea party. So the proof rock poem, probably narrated by a relatively young man, even though he worries about uh, balding, uh, probably a youngish man. Uh, Eliot wrote it when he was a college student and uh, not much beyond that. And Gerontion is of course, an old man, both by its title uh, and by the content of the poem. Whereas Proofrock is the micro scene of, do I have the courage to go to this tea party and talk to this unnamed woman? Gerontion is broadly universal. We wind up going around the Horn of South America at the end, and it talks about history and corridors and religion and Christ. And it's all over the map, a kind of breath of a man who's lived a long life and is now doing an inventory of it that is disappointing. So we can say about both of them that they are poems by their very form, somebody talking to himself, a younger man, an older man, uh, and one way or another conflicted about what the contemporary world uh, allows one to do. In Proof Rock, it's the combination of his wanting to go uh, let us go then, you and I, and constantly being undercut by his own timidity or the language that he uses. So any energy you hear in let us go then, you and I, is immediately sapped out of it by when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. A stunning image, a, um, a jolting image, if you were walking out with a roommate or a family member and they said, gee, uh, the sky is like a patient etherized upon a table, uh, you'd want to ask your friend if they're off their meds. I, I mean, what, what kind of sensibility thinks of the sky like a patient etherized upon a table? It's an image of uh, unconsciousness, of immobility, a lot of what goes on in this poem is about being stagnated, wanting to go, saying he's gonna go, there'll be time, we can go, let's go, let's go, there'll be time. Uh, and then finally deciding it's not worth going because she'll misunderstand whatever question he wanted to ask her. The idea that the sky would look like a patient who's not alive or not, uh, I shouldn't say not alive, not conscious also suggests a kind of God's absence in the universe. And it's the few decades before that Nietzsche uh, famously said, God is dead, which in German is a lot more emphatic, Gott is tot. So I'll stop there and say the poems have in common in their form, in their crypticness, in the fact that they make lots of allusions to other works without explaining them. Not to put you off, not to just bedevil my poor undergraduates who are convinced that these writers hate them, but to say this is the moment of cultural transition where we've lived through a devastating war and we don't know what we're left with. We're left with the jazz age, the roaring 20s that comes in with a bang and goes out with a stock market crash. So I'll pause there for a moment uh, to take any questions before I delve into the poems in more detail. Uh, Mark, we don't have any questions uh, so far. So um, I would say, um, yeah, you may go ahead. Okay. So again, I, I don't have the bandwidth. It's not that I don't think you're attentive or that you won't get it. There's just not enough time for me to read all of Proof Rock and comment it as we go. So I'll read the first verse paragraph. Uh, to make the point about how form is used. You'll listen to hear that most of the lines end with a word that gets a rhyme later on in the stanza. Here I go. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets 
the muttering retreats of restless nights in one night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it, let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. So I'll stop there and say, what you don't notice on a first reading, presumably, but you may notice through study, is that lots of words rhyme with other lines, eye and sky, streets and retreats, hotels and shell, because they're one after another. What is it, our visit, come and go, Michelangelo. But the line uh, that uh, I read earlier, like a patient etherized upon a table, that line that ends in table has no rhyme. It has no mate. It has no equal. And neither does the line later on in the stanza to lead you to an overwhelming question. There is no rhyme to the word question. It's not that he couldn't have fudged it. He's making a point that those two lines are emphatically different from the rest of the stanza. A patient etherized upon a table I've already commented on, and the overwhelming question is the whole point of the poem. That is, it may be a question like, will you go out with me? It may be that it's a proposal of marriage. It may be something else. But the question itself overwhelms Prufrock, who's not up to the task that he thinks of as being a crisis. Will I, among the tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? Uh, that rhyme later on in the poem between ices, that is sherbets or sorbets, and crisis shows you the mock heroic quality of the poem. That is, by comparing himself to heroic characters of Hamlet or John the Baptist or Lazarus, he shrinks his importance. Uh, you make fun of something by talking about it hyperbolically. This man is so conflicted, so timid, so unsure of his place in the modern world that he thinks of a, a question that he's going to ask this woman as overwhelming and that he can rhyme the word crisis, which of course is very significant, with ices, which is trivial. Uh, and that trivial takes the energy or the importance out of the crisis. His name is J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, a very English construction, very common, especially at this point in history uh, for men in England to use their first initial, especially if it was uh, a more common name like John or James, uh, and be a J. Um, Alfred Prufrock. Uh, Eliot's name was Thomas Stearns Eliot. Stearns is a family name. And as a young man, he styled himself for a while as T. Stearns Eliot. So J. Alfred Prufrock is a kind of affectation. Uh, and although um, Eliot would never uh, confess or confirm where the name Prufrock came from, uh, there's been suggestions that uh, there's a kind of prudery to this uh, character. He talks about seeing the arms of the woman um, bare and white, but then in parentheses, downed with light brown hair, as if he's more comfortable with the sculpture-like whiteness, the marble knight like whiteness of an uh, unhairy arm, uh, but then undone by any sense of actual human physicality. Uh, and some people have suggested that the word frock, uh, kind of dainty clothing, men did wear frocks at one time, not dresses, but long coats, um, that there's a kind of fussiness uh, in J. Alfred Prufrock as a name, and certainly the love song is meant to be ironic. So Eliot's not just poking fun at this man who likely is some version of himself. He's exploring the complicated dynamic of somebody who worries that he's not going to be accepted by a society that he thinks is beneath him, a society that he trivializes. In the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. There's no way to read that without it sounding sing-song. Uh, in the same way that Isis robs the word crisis of its strength, 
when you rhyme Michelangelo with women coming and going and then repeat that, you rob Michelangelo of his cultural value and he just becomes a sound. He just becomes a brand. Um, that line in its sing-songiness is very different from later on in the poem when he thinks, if she says, what is this all about? How should I begin? And then he says in this beautiful passage of eight lines that is nothing sing-songy. Shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. And then the lines I read before about um, the crisis and ISIS and feeling that he was afraid. For a moment, he speaks a natural rhythm about seeing lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. Oh. But he's not going to say that. He's worried that this, this party that trivializes life, he has measured out his life in coffee spoons. Uh, he has spent too much time, too much of his life at these kind of, excuse me, empty uh, events. Uh, he, he talks about the butt end of his days. Um, in um, Edith Wharton's a House of Mirth, my favorite novel of hers, a true masterpiece. One of the characters says of Lily Bart that even in the marriage game and find a husband, that she secretly despises the society she has to compete with. And that, of course, is true of Lily Bart and Edith Wharton's uh, novels generally. It's absolutely true here. The conflict is not just between uh, or within Alfred Prufrock. It's also the conflict that the society doesn't know Hamlet or Dante or um, uh, Shakespeare uh, or uh, Hamlet. The opening uh, Italian is from the Inferno uh, where uh, Guido says to Dante, if I thought you were ever gonna get out of hell, I wouldn't tell you my secret, but since I hear no one ever gets back, I'm happy to tell you. It's a kind of image of limbo, limbo rather than hell, because Dante, of course, does get out. And Gerontion begins with a quote uh, from uh, Measure for Measure by Shakespeare. Thou hast neither youth, thou hast nor youth nor age, but as it were an after dinner sleep dreaming of both. The two poems both begin with an image of limbo, they both end with references to water. In Proof Rock, it's that we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls read with seaweed, red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. That is, we become so infatuated with myth, with escapism, with romance, that when we are broken out of our daydream, daydream by reality, by human voices, it's the human voices that drown us. In the Odyssey, which this is a reference to, um, it was the siren voices that drowned the sailors and not the human voices. Um, so there's that inversion. And in Gerontion, we're told that this is a windy, dry place this is a man whose uh, head is empty. I'm not gonna read all these words, but Gerontion, even if you didn't know all the references to other literary works and who would and why should you, I'm just gonna read you in order a list of uh, a dozen or more words in the poem, old, dry, bitten by flies, decayed, blistered, patched, dull head, windy spaces, unable to speak, whisper, vacant, Drafty, windy, cunning, later on, um, confusion, famishes, weak, fear, tears, rented house, 
uh, not your own place. Uh, Toulouse, lost, adulterated, lost, delirium, wilderness of mirrors. Uh, this poem where he tries to figure out what do you do with history now that Christianity seems not to be valid anymore. That's the references to depraved May and Christ. What do you do? And it ends also with images of water that these various characters are whirled beyond the circuit of the shuddering bear in fractured atoms, gull against the wind in the windy straits of Belle Isle. So we're on the water now or running on the horn around South America, white feathers in the snow um, as the uh, feathers fall off the gulls, the gulf claims and an old man driven by the trades to a sleepy corner. So this image of water, like the images of water on the seaside in Truth Rock, but instead of being drowned, these poem ends with tenants of a Y, of a ha I'm sorry, tenants of the house, that is the ideas in his head, thoughts of a dry brain in a dry season. So images of global water, but the condition of the speaker is aridity, dryness. He needs rain, he needs water. And if you remember the wasteland, and if you've never read it and you were willing to give it a shot in the spirit of what I'm talking about tonight, not getting a guide to read it line by line, but just let it flow over you. The problem of the wasteland, this desiccated area that lacks value. And so we feel that we're living in a kind of uh, blighted landscape. And it is partly suffused by images of no man's land and the terrible trenches of the First World War. That poem ends by rain coming, a uh, resuscitative rain, uh, like the flood, which not only erases, but cleanses. So um, the poems have similarities in the isolation of a character who is ill at ease in his current situation, one, the micro situation of an invitation to a tea party of a, I think, younger man. The other, the broader issue of a man who doesn't know what to do with the empty thoughts in his head in a world that doesn't seem to believe in faith anymore. Uh, the isolation is underscored by their not talking to anyone but themselves. The dislocation from their own culture is uh, shown in the collage-like character where uh, proof rock is made up of different kinds of forms and uh, paragraphs and rhyme schemes. Uh, Geronchin is pulling references to lots of liter literary works. They both end with the characters being uh, near water or imagining water, but having no access to its value. It's either dry and they don't have access to water or it is an image of drowning. And now you may say, well, th this is not really very happy poetry, Mark. Uh, T.S. Eliot, the musical. Well, the T.S. Eliot did have a musical, uh, Cats. Uh, there's another side to T.S. Eliot. And he wrote a collection of whimsical poems about Old Possum's Book of Cats. Uh, and with the help of other people, it became a uh, award-winning and long-running show. My point is you shouldn't think that because these are two modes of Eliot's thinking and performance uh, that he is a negative man. He is making a criticism, that is to say, an evaluation of the state of the modern condition, which again is one of delocation and isolation and feeling that you wanna be part of something that on another level you disdain. Uh, that's the modern condition. In other poems and other works, he wears different kinds of masks um, poets are not like politicians who are supposed to be consistent, you'll excuse me for hoping, or philosophers who are supposed to be consistent, or political scientists, or any other kind of theatrician. Uh, poets are to try on different ways of thinking about and reacting to life. Uh, Shakespeare was a poet, poet, he wrote comedies, he wrote tragedies, he wrote histories, he wrote romances, very different genres, uh, one man.
So uh, I'll take a break now as we've come to, I believe, the second uh, 20 minutes, yeah, the second, third, and ask again if there are questions. Uh, yes, Mark, we do have uh, a couple of uh, questions and reflections. Uh, the first one is from Easy, and um, this is what she writes. Uh, Proof Rock has long been my favorite poem, and I've always read it not as an inner monologue, but as a poem in which the speaker talks directly to the reader. Part of Proof Rock's existential challenge is figuring out how to connect, particularly with women. But through the poem, he talks confessionally and directly to the reader and thereby is able to counteract the intellectual isolation of the era. I am not a literary scholar and don't know much about literary analysis. So would you be able to explain how the reader knows that Proofrock is speaking to himself rather than to the audience? The reader doesn't know that. I said, that's my view. Uh, the view that you have, I think is perfectly reasonable. And I wouldn't argue against it. In fact, there are many people who know a lot more about Eliot than you or I, who have the same view that you have, that the uh, proof rock is talking to the reader uh, and say, let us go together. Uh, and I think it's perfectly acceptable, not that you need me to approve it. I think people should read how they read. And if you're not sure if a reading is right, talk to other people who've read the poem or the book or the novel or the play and see if you can reach a consensus. I think it's a perfectly legitimate interpretation to say Proof Rock is talking to the reader and therefore reaching out. But I don't agree that he saves himself because if he's talking to the reader, the reader and Proof Rock don't go anywhere. He decides not to go. Uh, says that if she says that is not what I meant at all, he then goes, no, that is, no, I'm not going to go there. I am not Prince Hamlet. That is, I'm not a man who's being asked to act, nor meant to be. I'm an attendant, Lord, one that will do a swell of progress, start a scene or two, that is Polonius. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse at times indeed almost ridiculous, at almost at times the fool. That's the retreating from the confrontation. And then I'm gonna continue reading. The next stanza has the word I nine times. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. That is rolling them up in the French fashion and trying to be stylish, having cuffs at the bottom of his trousers. Shall I part my hair behind? That is because he's balding. Do I dare to eat a peach? Peaches were uh, rumored to be bad for your digestion. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. That is not go to this party. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each in his fantasy. And then a single line, I do not think they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves climbing, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and back. And then he goes from I to we. Now to the person who asked that question, if you reader are one of those we, that is you and Proof Rock are that we, it's not gonna end well for you. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. If one takes a position that the reader is being addressed by proof rock, you're in for a bad ride. Uh, you don't make the visit, you retreat with him and you wind up drowned. To my view, it makes more sense to see that he's in conflict with himself, that Eliot allows the reader to overhear that internal conflict, that interior monologue, uh, and that we see that he doesn't step up, he retreats from, uh, by virtue of his timidity, and he winds up not going there and submerging into his own lethargy, the, that image of the cat and the malingering and the yellow smoke 
uh, the kind of uh, uh, ether, being etherized, being completely immobile. But that's not to say that you can't read it the way you read it. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not just saying this because I'm at the Greenwich Library. This is what I tell my undergraduates. I tell them, you can write that way. You can make an argument for why this makes sense. But if I would have put your argument, which I don't uh, completely disagree with, alongside what I'm saying about the interior monologue and being in clock conflict with himself, my way of seeing allows me to make more sense of the poem than your way. But that's because it's my way. Uh, anyone can read any poem the way they like. Uh, there's no single right way to read a poem. We have a couple more questions, Mark. Um, the second one is, in Gerontian first stanza are the references to the Jew and the goat, to Leonard and Virginia Woolf, with whom Eliot had a sometimes close and sometimes combative relationships. If so, why are they referenced earlier on in the poem? Could you, could you repeat the last question? Uh, if so, why are they referenced early in the poem? The Jew and the goat, Leonard and Virginia Woolf. Okay, and, and where's the reference to Virginia Woolf, I'm sorry? In the first stanza. Can you identify that for me? Uh, if the, I can actually unmute the person who asked uh, the question and they can ask you live. Um, okay, here we go. So Mark, it's my question. This has been solved that Virginia Woolf was nicknamed the goat in childhood and that nickname oh. carried forward to a certain degree. So she's the goat and Leonard was referred to as the Jew by people in, in the Bloomsbury set, including by uh, Virginia. So okay. now I get, so, so that's the allusion again, not a reference. And, and I just wanna make it clear to everybody because these are important distinctions. Thank you for the question. I'll try to do the best I can with it. Um, a reference say, as Hamlet says, to be or not to be. And so even if you don't know who Prince Hamlet is, you know that some guy said this thing and you could look it up. The reference tells you I'm referring to something else. But an allusion would just to say in the middle of a poem, something's rotten in the state of Denmark, which comes from Hamlet, but doesn't tell you it comes from Hamlet. So these are allusions uh, to the goat and the Jew. I confess I know nothing about T.S. Eliot's view of Virginia Woolf or Leonard. Um, I will say that just on its own terms, uh, the Jew is often used by uh, Eliot anti-Semitically, there's no doubt about that, to talk about the kind of cultural degradation of European culture. So a Jew squatting uh, and being the owner is not a good thing. Uh, and of course, the goat is often associated both with uh, randiness with the sexual activity and non-discriminating appetite uh, and the, the goat that's coughing moves in an area with rocks, moss, scum crop, iron, and merge, that is to say feces. So uh, without my knowing what you know about Virginia Woolf and her husband, uh, I can make perfect sense of what those images mean early in this poem. Uh, he's talking about quite literally, a crappy world. Uh, this is not to say that what you know and I don't isn't valuable. I just can't know what I don't know. And even if what you say is true and I don't doubt it, if it means those things, it first also means it's actually a Jew and actually a goat. I, I wanna say to everyone, if symbolism and metaphor means anything, you first have to savor what's actually in front of you. If my love is like a red, red rose, uh, Robert Burns, and we're to understand from that, that the poet is saying something about his love by deriving qualities from the red, red rose. If you just jump to the fact, oh, he's talking about his girlfriend, you miss the fact that the rose is beautiful. It is fragile. Uh, it is evanescent, it's gonna pass. Uh, by contemplating the thing in front of you, you get a better understanding of a thing that's not. I'm sorry I don't know more to answer your question. It's possible, although I'm not gonna ask you to do it now, that you may know the answer to your own question 
by why it comes so early, but I don't, I'm sorry. Uh, we have um, another question from Helene and Nadim. If Proof Rock is about a younger man, why all the references to old age, bald spot, thinning air, hair, thin arms and legs, rolled up trouser bottoms, fear of eating a peach? Don't these sound like the self-conscious worries of an old man? They do. That's the point. They sound like an old man, but he's not an old man in my view. Uh, I will tell you as someone who has taught undergraduates for most of his adult life, if you don't think that young men worry about ball spots, you haven't met enough young men. Um, it's not something that only older men think about. And younger men can worry about being scrawny. And when he says, I grow old, I grow old, uh, near the end of the poem, it's not that in my view, again, uh, I'm not trying to force my view on you. But when I show up, you're going to get my view. Um, a man who is actually growing old doesn't have to say he's growing old. Uh, he feels he's growing old because he's had another chance to get out, to go to this place, and he doesn't. Uh, and he realizes he seemed like an old man. Uh, again, I know young men and women who seem old. And when he says, where the bottom of my trousers rolled, he means maybe I should be stylish. Again, he could be an older man, but in my view, what makes this so sad is he's not an older man. He's a younger man who has a chance still to embrace life and he passes it by. It's not uncommon for someone with that fear of social contract, uh, of, of social contact to imagine themselves as prematurely old. Again, I, I can only say that's the way uh, that I see this. But before I take the next uh, question, uh, when I stopped with uh, uh, talking about the men in shirt sleeves, I want to continue with that paragraph. The afternoon malingers stretched on the floor like a cat here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. Again, you, you have to hear the gulf between the pettiness of cakes and ices and his idea that this is a moment of crisis. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, that is no John the Baptist, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, his greatness, getting up the courage to ask a woman out. And I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. That rhyme, afraid, goes back to wept and prayed. But you see, it's a very short line. The long line is, though I have seen my head grow slightly bald, brought in upon a bladder. That's so long that my page won't accommodate it. And then in short, I was afraid. He is afraid to ask this question because although he says I'm no prophet, only someone uh, who would think of themselves as possibly John the Baptist would say I'm no John the Baptist. I'm not Prince Hamlet. A man who doesn't think of himself as particularly heroic wouldn't say I'm no Prince Hamlet. Hamlet, Hamlet in his play says, I'm not Hercules. Well, that's because he has enough opinion of himself to say, I'm not Hercules. I have never said about myself, I'm not Hercules. That's how mock heroic works. It compares something petty to something large to emphasize the gulf between them. In Duck Soup, I show you my rich cultural uh, background. Groucho Marx is the leader of a country called Fredonia, and he's been insulted by the ambassador of another country. And he's trying to figure out what he should do to pay back this ambassador for his insolence. And he says, I have a good idea to ring your doorbell and run. What makes that line funny is the enormous gap between his indignation as the head of a nation and the petty action of a schoolboy or schoolgirl who would do this pathetic little uh, gimmick. 
the poem is loaded with that kind of thing. So after he says, truly, that I was afraid, then he imagines, he rationalizes why he shouldn't go because she's not going to understand. Would it have been worthwhile? After all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, you see the sing song quality. Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. Um, he's in the the death, the inferno of his own isolation, uh, should I break out of that and say, here I am, if one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all. That, that is not it at all. And would it have been worthwhile? Would it have been worthwhile? Now, remember, he said the, key, the marmalade, the cups, the tea. Now the poem changes its register, its tone. And would it have been worthwhile after all? Would it have been worthwhile? after the sunsets and the dooryards, I'm just keeping an eye on the time for your sake, and the sprinkled streets after the novels, after the teacups and the skirts that trail along the floor and this and so much more. It's impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magical lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen. That is, I wish I could show you my inside without having to speak. I wish I could have a kind of um, projection of my inner thoughts. Would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. And so after he says he's afraid to push the overwhelming question, he rationalizes it wouldn't be worth the effort if he's turned down. And to me, that's a young man's fear. That is someone uh, who's not experienced in this kind of thing. I will say I'm also influenced by my knowledge that he was a young man when he wrote the poem. Uh, and even though he is not very much an autobiographical poet, nobody can stay out of their own way. I see we're nearing the top of the hour. So Kate, do you have other questions that have been waiting? Uh, okay. Um, okay. Um, to your um, earlier reference, each and pitch another pairing that negates the meaning. That's the question from attendee. Each and pitch uh, another pairing that negates the meaning? Question mark. <laughs> Well, it's actually not a pairing. It's what's called a triplet, peach, beach, each. Mm -hmm. It's a of, of rhymes, uh, just as we have in other places in the poem. Um, again, the do I dare to eat a peach I've had explained to me was this notion that peaches were bad for your digestion. So is he going to do the courageous thing like ringing a doorbell and run? That's another kind of mock heroic. Um, I, I don't know if that's answered your question well enough, but let me make a final point before we come to an end. Uh, in the paragraph that I read, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, he says emphatically, I am not Prince Hamlet, there's the I. But then for the rest of the paragraph, there is no I, nor was meant to be. Am an attendant Lord, the second line has no I. It's as if his I has been erased when he's trying to think, if he the kind of person who can be heroic? And for the rest of that paragraph down to fool, there is no subject of the sentence. There is no I. It's as if he's already been erased. What does it take to bring the I back? He brought back in the next stanza or next series of stanzas nine times because now he's left the world of potentially heroic action and he's growing old and he'll wear the bottoms of his trousers, all the things that we've read. He's comfortable with the eye of self-pity, uh, but his eye, his agency, his self-possession is nearly completely erased in the preceding stanza. That's the kind of detail that Eliot and other great poets um, offer you if you're willing to look for those kinds of things and not necessarily read the poem side by side with a manual 
uh, to tell you where things come from. I'm, I'm not denigrating that. More is more. But I don't think you should feel that to read James Joyce uh, or to read um, T.S. Eliot, or for that matter, to read Dante in a good translation, you need to have a guidebook with you. If you read it as art, if you try to capture the experience, um, uh, I think anyone who reads Prufrock carefully feels that it's a deeply conflicted poem. Anyone who reads Gerontian, um uh, carefully sees that this is a windy, desiccated, uh, isolated, um, desperate man looking for some comfort that's not coming. Because religion, um, if we were to explicate the entire poem, seems to have been replaced in a modern world by depravity, that is by perversion, uh, not necessarily sexual perversion or depravity in the sense of evil, but the word depraved means perverted or distorted, uh, that instead of the religion of Christ, we have these uh, cosmopolitan foreign named people doing a kind of black mass, a kind of perversion of Christianity. That's very much in the wheelhouse of T.S. Eliot. Gerontian has never been as popular and as accessible a poem as the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and whoever said this earlier, I also admire this poem very much and think it's one of the great documents of early 20th century literature. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we are at eight o'clock, Mark. And, um, you know, thank you for wonderful lecture as usual. A great conversation. We're looking forward to, you know, seeing you back in the fall. And Kate, let me just repeat the offer you made earlier, especially if I didn't do justice to any of them that are waiting for me or ones that I heard but didn't do well with. Uh, if you want to send a question to my email, uh, which Kate can provide you, uh, I will be happy to answer you. I am actually on a paid time off tomorrow because I have a family wedding to attend to, so you may not get an answer immediately. But if you put an answer in the chat, or, or you heard my partial answer or not very satisfying answer, you want another shot, or if something occurs to you uh, as you descend the stairs of this meeting, uh, write to me and I'll do my best to get back to you promptly. Thank you as always, Kate, for your help. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you back in fall. Okay. Stay well, everybody. Stay healthy. Mm -hmm.